Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is when you're watching or listening to this podcast. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, and it is my great privilege to lead discussions about all things Bible and theology with some of my favorite professors, Bible scholars, and Bible expositors. And I'm pleased this week to have on the program Pastor Jesse Randolph. Pastor Randolph is the pastor teacher of Indian Hills Community Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. He holds a Master of Divinity from the Master's Seminary and is pursuing his Master of Theology from Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Pastor Randolph has published journal articles in the Journal of Ministry and Theology, the Interdisciplinary Journal on Biblical Authority, and the Master's Seminary Journal. Prior to being called into the ministry, Pastor Randolph was a successful lawyer. He practiced law for 20 years. Pastor Randolph, welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Thanks for having me, Dr. Weaver. Uh, grateful for you, the ministry of the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, your work at Dallas Theological Seminary. Happy to be on the program. Pastor Randolph, first, if you would, share with our listeners a little bit about your unconventional path to the pastorate. Yeah, unconventional is the right word. I, um, I came to faith a little bit later in life. The Lord saved me when I was actually just about 30 uh, years old. Um, I was an attorney by trade in a, in a former life. I uh, definitely had, had the, the law and the practice of law as my idol, as a non-believer. And it was the year, actually, I was up for partner that I first heard the gospel message. I'd been going through a number of various life-related trials, didn't really have answers to those trials, and despite all the, the legal training and the uh, you know, education I had, they, they didn't give me uh, answers. I had no answers and had no hope ultimately. So um, I got saved the year I was up for partner. And uh, that just was that, that flashpoint of, am I going to go the direction of where I had always gone, you know, pursuing my idol, the law? They always called it the golden ring of partnership in a law firm. Or am I going to follow Christ? And am I going to devote, devote every aspect of my life and living to him? And that's not to say that you can't be a Christian lawyer uh, or serve the Lord faithfully in the law. Many men have done so, and women. Um, but for me, it was, such, it was so grafted into my identity as a non-believer that uh, when the Lord saved me, he uh, pulled me away from the law. And as time went on with training and affirmation by elders and such, I, I was called to the ministry. Well, that's a wonderful testimony. I'm curious, are there any skills that you learned in law school and in law profession that translate over to the pastorate? Sure. Um, I would say critical analysis and engagement. Um, I've always been a reader and, you know, you have to read a lot as a lawyer. You're reading cases and statutes and, and law journals, and that does carry over to uh, the reading of scripture and commentaries and journals and, and, and the like. So just processing and sifting through biblical, exegetical, theological data is a, there is kind of a neat segue between what I used to do as a lawyer and, and sifting through all that data. Um, I would say the ability to process and communicate information logically and clearly. I mean, that is the mark of a lawyer. You are to take that information and then convey it to your audience, whether that be a judge or a, an arbitrator or a mediator or a client. Um, now it's to a congregation or to a church member um, or to a, a circle of academia that you might be writing to. I will say, though there are benefits and, and carryover, there can be drawbacks too. Um, so I'm, I'm a, the pastor teacher here at Indian Hills, so I preach every Sunday morning and evening. And there, the, the, very same, the very aspect of having been a lawyer that can be a strength, clarity, logic, that sort of thing, can also, I think, if I'm not careful, be a hindrance. And I mean, what I mean by that is uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones once said that, that, that the preacher is not only to be an advocate, he's to be a witness. And if you're too legally minded and too, you know, trying to dance on the head of a pin too much, uh, you can sound up there like you're just, uh, just a matter-of-fact advocate versus pleading your case to your people uh, from the truth of God's word. So I'm always trying to make sure I'm not being 
too formal and too formulaic, like a, a barrister or a legal mind in court, but rather uh, a, a witness for God and his word. As we orient ourselves to the prophetic books in general, and the book of Hosea in particular, please remind our listeners of key hermeneutical principles that are important to consistently implement in our interpretation of the text. Sure. Uh, there are a number I could give. Uh, the, the, the few I'll provide now are just very simple reminders, and hopefully these will be a benefit to your audience. But just remembering that Hosea, the book of Hosea, like any Old Testament prophet, like any of the 66 books of the Bible, is God's word. The book of Hosea is God's word. So 2 Timothy 3.16, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And what that means practically is you go through the book of Hosea, and we won't have time to do this all today, but and there's references to Israel being a silly dove or a, a half-baked cake or a stick on the water, a twig on the water. Even those words, which seem like they're so distant from us and have such a unique context in Israel, 2 Timothy Second Timothy 3.16 would say they're profitable, profitable for the believer today. So that'd be one principle. Another one would be to remember that Hosea is Jewish scripture. Um, Hosea's prophecy was originally delivered through and to, uh, through Hosea to the northern tribes of Israel. It wasn't written to the church directly. It wasn't written to English-speaking Christians like you and me. It was rather addressed to Israel 2,800 years ago in the language of the day, Hebrew, and that means it has all kinds of uniquely Hebrew expressions and idioms uh, baked within the book. So it's, that's another idea here. Um, third is that Hosea is, though it's Jewish scripture, it's also Christian scripture. The uh, assumption I have, knowing this is the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, is that uh, your audience, most of them, are believers in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though Jewish, and although his ministry initially was directed to the Jews of the day, claimed himself to be the savior of the world, and Hosea's words uh, that the Messiah would have known and, and quoted at times, uh, they have been recognized over the centuries as belonging to the Christian canon of Scripture. Uh, another presupposition or a guiding principle for us today as we come to the book of Hosea is to consider that theology, any aspect of theology, is to be built brick by brick from Scripture, built up from Scripture. Um, as Bible-minded, Bible-believing Christians, we build our theological positions, our theological convictions, uh, not on what Augustine or Anselm or Bavinck said in some very um, carefully written tome, some theological tome. Uh, we recognize where we sit today that we stand on the shoulders, uh, shoulders of certain theologians from church history past, but only to the extent those theologians were standing on Scripture, not on some extra-biblical methodology. I always quote Bernard Ram on this point where he says, a theological system is to be built up exegetically brick by brick. Hence, the theology is no better than the exegesis that underlies it. And that's true of all matters of theology and matters of eschatology and to our topic today, prophecy, like you see in the book of Hosea. Um, so that's another one, building your theology brick by brick. Uh, the next one I'll mention would be that as um, those who want to rightly handle the word and proclaim the word, the, we ought to be reading the Bible forward, not backward. And by that I mean we read each book of the Bible, uh, whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, in its original context. So if we're reading Old Testament law, we're putting ourselves in the sandals of those who are at Sinai. Uh, if we're reading a northern prophet like Hosea from the 8th century B.C., we're learning and understanding and giving primacy to what his context was as he was writing. We're, we're, we're reading the Old Testament uh, not through the lens of the New Testament. That'd be reading backwards. We're not looking for Jesus on every page of the Old Testament. That'd be reading the Bible backwards. Rather, we, ho we handle the 39 books of the Old Testament for what they are. God's revelation of himself, his character, his purposes uh, to Old Testament Israel— at the very time he revealed what he revealed. So I would say we, we resist the appeal, or we, we resist the urge, though it might have some appeal to us, to um, read the Bible through this Christocentric lens, or to find, again, Jesus on every page. Rather, we read the Bible progressively, from the back to the front, from Genesis to Revelation, uh, not the other way around. And that means putting our 
again, ourselves in the sandals of a prophet like Hosea. Um, one more on that topic would be biblical prophecy. We, we ought to come to it. And, and Hosea is a prophetic book. It's an Old Testament prophet. Uh, it's to be literally fulfilled. We come to prophetic works with the presupposition that prophecy will be um, literally fulfilled. Now, we, we understand and we acknowledge that in certain prophetic books, there's a higher degree at times of symbolic language or figurative language, um, but that is not even really the norm still in prophecy. So when we come to prophetic material like Hosea, we use normal principles of hermeneutics, consistent, literal, grammatical principles of hermeneutics. Um, we're not going to a book like Hosea assuming that everything is going to be allegorical, that we should spiritualize or um, make everything figurative. For instance, a statement that like that people will live to be more than 100 years in the millennium, we take that to be 100 years, not some spiritual meaning. Um, nor are there any reasons to spiritualize or allegorize the terms of the covenant promises that God made to Moses and to Abraham in the, in the time in which we live. So major point there is not all prophetic texts have some sort of deeper mystical meaning that need to be spiritualized or allegorized. We only divert from the uh, this assumption that, that prophetic texts are to be taken literally if there's clearly some sort of symbolism that's being used, um, as opposed to just reading it plainly off the pages of Scripture. Before we get into some of the prophetic passages of Hosea, please share with our listeners the historical context, getting ourselves into the sandals, as you said, of the recipients of the prophetic book of Hosea. Sure, I, I, and that's a great idea to start there. Because this is a book, Hosea, uh, that not only gets overlooked in, in much modern-day Bible reading among, among Christians, serious Bible reading, but it gets little attention in pulpits today, and um, maybe even less attention in the field of prophetic studies. Uh, so we should start with that time frame. What's going on in this book? And I have it open here too in front of me. But the, the very first book of uh, first verse of this book says, The word of the Lord, which came to Hosea, the son of Beri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So we see five kings listed there. Now, four of those are from the south. That'd be Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And one of them is from the north, uh, Jeroboam, the son of Joash. And based on the dates of the reigns of those kings, those five kings that we see listed in Hosea 1.1, and how those reigns overlapped and, and intersected, we can confidently assert, I believe, that Hosea prophesied to the ten tribes of the north from somewhere between 755 B.C. and 710 B.C., uh, meaning right in the middle of those final days before Israel was defeated and taken captive by Assyria, which was in 721 B.C., so that's the basic time frame, the, the historical setting, historical uh, time frame. Now, putting a little bit more meat on those bones, uh, we know at this point the kingdom uh, was divided. Some 225 years had passed from that infamous split between Rehoboam and, and Jeroboam following the reign of Solomon. And though this was this period of uh, political and, and economic prosperity in Israel, uh, some have called it even the second golden age of Israel, this was a time in Hosea's day that was marked by spiritual idolatry. So Israel was comfortable, it was prosperous, at the same time it was spiritually wayward and spiritually adulterous. Sound like any nations in our day, potentially? I won't go there. Um, but all the while, looming in the north, to the north of the northern tribes, was this burgeoning empire of Assyria. And Assyria is growing in power. They're threatening to invade and, and take the 10 northern tribes captive. Um, so there's all this tension happening in the, in, the, in the land. Spiritually or economically prosperous, spiritually wayward, very much under threat and potential duress. But ultimately, the biggest problem that Israel faced at this time was not even the growing political power of Assyria. The biggest problem they faced was this looming threat of judgment from God, whom they had turned their back on. Uh, God had been very clear to Israel, going all the way back to the days of his giving of the law at Sinai, what would happen to them if, he, if they disobeyed him, and specifically if they went after other gods. Um, God had promised to judge. You just have to go to Deuteronomy uh, 28. God had promised to judge and bring curses upon his people uh, for violating his law. 
Uh, Deuteronomy 28.15 would be a reference for that. But not only that, in some of those curses, there were specific references made years before about Israel one day being taken into captivity if they were to violate what he had laid out for them in, in the law. And that's exactly where Israel now found itself in the days of Hosea. They'd been disobedient, uh, they'd been faithless, and now they're about to pay the price and be hauled off into captivity. Thank you for that. You did a great job of laying out that historical context, understanding the United Monarchy is a distant memory, isn't it? Yep, yep. And uh, so we're getting ready for some judgment to unfold, aren't we? That's right. Well, for the remainder of our time together, we want to investigate several prophetic passages in Hosea. These passages present great hope for the ethnic national Israel, despite Israel's covenant unfaithfulness. So I invite you to take your copy of the scriptures, you that are listening and watching, and turn with us to the first passage that we want to discuss, and that's Hosea 1, verses 10 to 11. And now I'm reading... Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited, and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Pastor Randolph, please explain the prophetic significance of this passage and how unexpected it is in light of the previous verses of judgment. I'd be happy to, and I, and I appreciate the way you phrased that, because this truly is, where we get to verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1, unexpected. In fact, uh, we could say it's shocking, because you can't look at those two verses and understand their meaning with what, with, without understanding what comes before them. And what comes before them is that whole scene, your, your audience might remember, in fact, we can turn up there to Hosea at the beginning of the book again, where God commands Hosea to marry a prostitute and to have children with that prostitute. A, a literal event, by the way, which was going to serve as this object lesson related to Israel's own covenant infidelity to, to Yahweh. Hosea 1 uh, verse 2 says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. And then, then Hosea is told to, to name those children and then, and then the names he was to give those children and the names he was to give those children were, were nothing but ominous and foreboding and shocking. The first child was to be named Jezreel meaning bloodshed, that was the significance of the word at this time. And in the context of, of giving the child that name at that time, God says, um, I will, uh, where is this? Uh, this is verse four. I will punish the house of Jehu, uh, name him Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Israel, Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. So first child is to be named Jezreel, name, namely bloodshed. The second child is to be named Lo Ruhama, meaning no mercy, no compassion from the Hebrew verb Raham. And the, and the logic for that child being named that name is given in Hosea 1.6. Name her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, that I would ever forgive them. And then when it comes to child number three, we see the name, um, the, the reason for that child being named, what, what they were named in verses eight and nine of chapter one, when she, that's... Hosea's wife Gomer had weaned Lo Ruhama. She conceived and gave birth to a son, and the, the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. I mean, ouch. Talk, talk about a, a bleak outlook. We have here this prophet with this prostitute of a wife, and then there's these three children lined up little bloodshed, little no compassion, little not my people. And it's all divinely designed by Yahweh to teach. Israel a lesson related to their apostasy and their rebellion. So that's all this setup, and that's why, to use your word, unexpected, verses 10 and 11 are, are so unexpected. They really do mark this, this pivot point in the text. And you already read the words, so I won't read them again, but what we see here is this, this sudden turn of events, starting with that very important word at the head of verse 10 there, yet, yet. 
Uh, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. That's hearkening back to the promises that were made to Abram, Abraham in Genesis 13. I will make your descendants like the, as the dust of the earth. Or the promise in Genesis uh, 15, 5. He says, uh, he takes Abraham outside and he says, now look towards the heavens, count the stars if you're able to count them, so shall your descendants be. Uh, later, uh, after um, Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22, there's a similar promise made. I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed, God to Abraham and to Israel, as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Now, perhaps by in Hosea's day, in the context of 8th century northern tribes, it may have seemed like God's promises now to Israel to, through Abraham were in jeopardy on account of Israel's sin and, and Israel's rebellion, and that this looming judgment of, of God through his chosen instrument, Assyria, was going to mean the end of the promise and the end of the covenant that God had made. But in reality, those promises were never in jeopardy of going unfulfilled. God had made everlasting promises to Abraham, and those promises never were and never will be in jeopardy of being broken. So this is, yes, a, a major shift in the narrative to boil it down. We both have a strong conviction about the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, these are unconditional promises, right? right? That even when Israel is unfaithful, and we see this in all the prophets, don't we? Even in the judgments that are declared, there's always a statement of hope, yeah. expectation of restoration. And so there certainly are those outside of, you know, we're both dispensational in our perspective, those outside of that. And I think most of our listeners understand what I mean by the term dispensational. We believe in a future plan for ethnic Israel, that God isn't done with Israel, that the church isn't replaced Israel in any way. But would you help us with this, Hosea one eleven? Has it been fulfilled literally? Uh, has it been fulfilled spiritually? And if so, how do we know? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, no, it hasn't. Um, what we have in verse 11 is unfulfilled prophecy. Uh, let's start with those words, and the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together. Now, again, we know from uh, the days of Rehoboam, that son of Solomon, that the nation had been divided into the northern tribes of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. But now here in verse 11, God's promising to gather them together again, to reform his people as one people. And, and when is that reunification to take place? Now, now, some have attempted to argue that this reunification in some sense has already taken place. Some will say it's taken place, it took place historically, even during the days of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah following the decree of Cyrus to uh, rebuild Jerusalem after the Jews returned from exile. But that really doesn't fit uh, because while there are certain traces of at least some cohesion between Judah and Israel in the post exilic period, there was never total cohesion between the, the two groups in that in that period. The way Hosea one eleven is per, portraying it as being uh, one people, so that that idea of reunification of of each of the twelve tribes didn't come to fruition. In, I believe in the days of certainly not in the days of Hosea, uh, not in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the the post exilic period, not in the days of Jesus, and not even in our day. What this leaves us then is with the reality that this is speaking to a future day of reunification that's being described in, in verse 11. And that future day uh, of what it says here, the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel being gathered together, has to be interpreted in light of what comes next here in verse 11, where it says, and they will appoint for themselves one leader. So putting those puzzle pieces together here in verse 11 this is speaking of a future day of reunification of God's original people, Israel, now rejoined with Judah, under one head, one ruler, one king. And we know from other passages of Scripture that that one king would come from the line of David. Uh, in fact, if your readers want to, I'm going to read a section here. They can turn to uh, Ezekiel 37. And I'll read a section of Ezekiel 37 here, which ties into what you're asking about here, about Hosea 111. But Ezekiel 37, 21 through 23 says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, 
And I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them, and they will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God." So as in Hosea, Ezekiel here is picturing regathered Israel. That's the picture he's painting. And it sounds very Hosea-like. The one, they will be my people, I will be their God. But then if you keep on reading in, in Ezekiel 37, he says this, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I give to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I'll just leave it there for now. But this time of, of spiritual, of, of restoration, this unification of regathered Israel, it's saying here will take place under this single shepherd and king from the line of David. That's how I take the, the my servant David language there in Ezekiel 37. And of course, that's going to take place when this Davidic king the Messiah of Israel, the Christ of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns to this earth to usher in his millennial kingdom, his, his literal 1,000-year reign here on earth. So this period of restoration, unification, will happen on that day when the Lord Jesus sets his feet on the very place from which he ascended. You know, when Zechariah 14.4 speaks of him putting his feet to stand on the Mount of Olives in front of, in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from the east to the west by a very large valley. Uh, that, that future day is going to bring about the reunification of Judah and Israel. There'll be the singular rulership and kingship of Christ, which is exactly what Zechariah 14.9 says. And the Lord will be king over all the earth, in that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name, the only one. That's great. Uh, so important. I appreciate that. Uh, especially as you emphasize Zechariah 14, Mount of Olives is a very important location, mm -hmm. isn't it? His disciples ask, what are the events that will precede your return and the end of the age? Right. And they're there on the Mount of Olives. And he describes the tribulation period prior to Christ's return. And then Acts 1, yeah. right? When we... Uh, they're gathered again on the Mount of Olives. And what do the disciples ask? Is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom? Yep. Right? And uh, they're at the right place. The, I think they are connecting the dots there. But Jesus, of course, says it's not now. But uh, what you need to do now until then is be my messengers to the ends of the earth. So Indeed. Mount of Olives, so important, isn't it? Prophetically, um, Jose is alluding to that, Zechariah 14. Yep. Our time is up for this week's Bible and Theology Matters podcast, but we are far from finished discussing this very important prophetic book, the book of Hosea. In our next episode, Pastor Jesse Randolph will return to discuss what the rest of the book of Hosea has to say about the literal and future restoration of ethnic Israel to the land of Israel. You won't want to miss it. If you're a regular listener to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast and you have benefited from our programming, would you consider giving just $5 or $10 a month, the price of just one or two coffees a month? Presently, we are a very small operation. It's just my wife and I. We do all the video capturing, audio capturing, editing, and social media, and we've not made any significant financial appeals. But we do have costs that we incur, and we would love to be able to hire someone part-time to do some of the video and audio editing work so that I can focus more on uh, theological education, writing, and missions. If you'd like to help with even just $5 a month and receive a tax-deductible receipt, please go to BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com, and click on the Give link. Thanks for your prayerful consideration. Until next time, never forget, Bible and theology matters because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow 
in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.